Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. In less time than it takes to read this disclaimer, the universe came into existence. In the beginning, there was only energy moving everywhere at the speed of light. Now, there are clumps of energy called matter moving in relation to one another at very low speeds. And if you look close enough, you'll see that at the atomic scale, the motion of our energy bits continues to zip about at the speed of light. Nothing has slowed. The universe has offered zero resistance to our energy's existence even 13 plus billion years later. Life began here on Earth as chemical change, something resembling a virus perhaps, that replicated, changed, and grew. From the atomic scale to the microbial, the universe expanded its ability to reproduce information. From that microbial to the multicellular mammalian brain, another several magnitudes of systems came into being. And with the sentient cognitive human intellect, no barriers remain between information and what we humans truly represent in this otherwise material universe. For even though we live on one, but one planet around one of 70 sextillion plus stars, we humans are the consciousness of the universe, the self-reflecting aspect of mind of a universe made conscious by us, through us, as our own brains contain our individual identity. The collective consciousness of all humanity is the self-aware identity and mind of the universe. We are the mind of the universe. And with that in mind, This Week in Science, coming up next. Kirsten and Blair. Good science to you too, Justin. Happy Thursday. Happy, happy Thursday. It's been a big week as usual. We oh, we made it to the wall last week. That was some show, I've got to say. Got to say it was good. Got to have some music every once in a while. And then back to the science. Back to the science. And then you, then you mix them together, the science and the music. And then it's like having peanut butter and chocolate and everything is fantastic. Right? Right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I'm feeling it. You're feeling it. Well, are you feeling the science news this week? It's This Week in Science, everybody. And we're here once again with Science News. A ton of great stories this week. I don't even know where to begin. Well, let me start. We're, I have stories about uh, whale ears. Yes. Whale ears. I said it. Uh, sugar and fish oil, and a burning ring of fire. What did you bring, Justin? I brought happiness, <clears throat> is, is being a, uh, a parent and the, the source of it there. Uh, some autism, schizophrenia, and obesity linked to, to genes? Mm -hmm. Bionic eye. Bionic eye. And a uh, biggest turtle you ever uh, heard of. Ooh, big turtles. Blair, what did you bring? I brought a story about crows. We know crows are super smart, but they actually might know more about us than we think. Ooh. Wow. For those... <laughs> 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 Something I always like telling people at concerts, they know. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, it's time to get into this science news. I hope we can get through all these stories because all of them are very interesting and exciting. Let's kick the show off tonight with a story about something that's found in every walk of life going back to the beginning of life. A story about the clock that ticks for life itself. The biological clock. Researchers working at a Washington University uh, have, or actually um, at the University of Cambridge, completely different place, <laughs> at the University of Cambridge, have been working on trying to find a universal clock. 
So we have our biological clock that pretty much runs on the 24-hour cycle, and it tells us when to wake up in the morning, when we're going to get tired, when to go to sleep. It it tells us when we're going to be hungry. Every cell in our body is controlled by a, a master clock at one point. But the key here is every cell in our body has a clock in it. For those of you who think you can't tell time, really, you're telling time in an amazingly wonderful way in every single cell of your body at all times of the day or night. So. No wonder I'm so tired. <laughs> right. <laughs> your cells are doing a lot all of work. All those clocks ticking at once. I all can't sleep. Clocks. Yeah, that's right. And the fact also that we are a meta organism, uh, it is true. We have more microbes on and in us than human cells. And so the question is, are all of those microbes, are those microbes ticking along in synchrony and in unison with us? The answer is yes, they have clocks in them as well. And these researchers Akilesh Reddy and John O'Neill at the University of Cambridge have found the universal clock. It ticks, according to this article from uh, the Discover Magazine blogs, Not Rocket Science, written by Ed Yong. Uh, it ticks in all kingdoms of life. And it's based on proteins that are called uh, shortened to PRX, but known as peroxyredoxins. Try and say that three times facts, fast. Peroxyredoxins. Mm. And what they do is they, they help mop up free radicals. And so if you've heard us talk about oxygen before and uh, the effects of oxygen on metabolism, you know that oxygen is, although it's wonderful, wonderful for allowing us to stay alive, it's also very damaging. And be, because it, um, as it breaks down, you get these free radicals that are free to uh, bump into other molecules and change them slightly and that can cause damage and then your cells have to deal with that damage and so one of the tools that the, that the cells of all walks of life have come up with or that that developed very early in the development of life were these peroxyredoxins and so they found that this prx clock it's unusual because it involves single proteins that are chemically changed and then changed back. And so instead of genetic, uh, a genetic clock where you have clock genes being turned on and then activating proteins that uh, turn off those genes where it's gene on make protein, protein turns off gene. Gene on make protein, protein turns off gene where it's a clock in that way. In this sense, it is the, it, the, it's a chemical change of um, of these single proteins. So the proteins themselves are on and off. Um, so all kingdoms of life have these loop-based clocks um, and all of them at some point come back to this protein, this PRX discovery. And what the uh, scientists argue is that it shows that the clocks, that clocks don't necessarily have to work on feedback loops, that you don't need to have this on-off loop going constantly, that the proteins themselves can go click, tick, talk back and forth between different chemical conformations. Um, <clears throat> and so O'Neill and Reddy think that the clocks might have evolved about the same time as uh, oxygen was increasing on our planet. So as the planet was getting more and more oxygen, the early forms of life had to deal with this oxygen and what it was doing to them metabolically, respiratorially, physiologically. Um, and so that so these proteins arose to help do that and in the process uh, may have led to these clocks being developed. So it's a the chain of events that they've come up with is a hypothesis, but at the same time, they can move forward and test some of the predictions. And so, um, <clears throat> let's wait, what for it, what example that Yang gives is that if a species hasn't evolved defenses against free radicals, it shouldn't have any circadian rhythms either. So it should have no clock rhythms, no day night uh, day night rhythms. It shouldn't have any kind of um, of 
of biological clock. And so they found one species, a methane-eating archaea bacteria. It's methanopyrae. It lives in hot undersea vents. Um, they don't necessarily know. They know it doesn't have any... Uh, or they know that it doesn't have any defenses against free radicals because it doesn't really live in an oxygen-rich environment, but uh, they don't know whether or not it has a clock. And so the problem is actually getting this microbe to thrive in the lab to be able to find out if it has a tick-tock clock. And so now also the question is whether or not this PRX clock, this protein that goes back and forth, interacts with the feedback loops, how it interacts with the with the genetic clocks that have developed as uh, organisms have become more complicated. And, uh, and Yang suggests that the PRX proteins are universal cogs of a primitive fundamental clock. And so it might have been the basic clock before, uh, before all other clocks that told us how to tell time came about. Pretty sweet. I see you just pondering that idea. <sighs> anyway. Well, it's sort yeah. of like the first, the first, uh, the first beats too. You know, what I mean, the first time, the first rhythm that the uh, that the universe really had. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's so o oxygen led to these peroxyredoxins, which made little clocks, which may have formed the basis for all circadian rhythms. That. That jump, though, still has yet to be completely proven, but it's uh, it's a really interesting idea. Very good idea. What you got there? How big would you say the biggest turtle ever is? What would you guess? Mm -hmm. What would you what would you compare it to size wise? The biggest turtle ever. Ever. Oh wow! I bet there was a really big one that was probably like. Do you think as big as this room? Do you think there was a turtle as big as this room, Blair? I think there was one about the size of a VW Beetle. A I'm VW say. Beetle. Wow, that's that's pretty close, <laughs> actually. That one there. Uh, they've compared it to the size of a smart car, which is uh, uh, pretty Sorry. close. <laughs> it's the new generation's know, right? Beetle. <laughs> right, right. right. Old now, what just happened? <laughs> a uh, five foot seven, uh, five feet seven inches long. They say the uh, the shell could have doubled as kind of like a kiddie pool, if you can picture that. Right? Pretty wild. They uh, they first discovered uh, this is down. They discovered this down in Columbia. This was the University of North Carolina State University. Found the fossilized remains, sixty million year old South American giant, in uh, in Columbia. That is that's pretty insane. I can't. I mean, I can't. I can't even imagine uh, seeing eh, seeing something that that large of a of a turtle cruising around. As long as it's not a snapping turtle and doesn't want to eat ah. me. You know, it it very likely was because you figure something that large. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe might not. not have to snap so hard if you're that large. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, here's the quote from uh, from one of the researchers, Edwin Kadena. We had recovered smaller turtle specimens from the site, but after spending about four days working on uncovering the shell, I realized that this particular turtle was the biggest anyone found in this area for this period of time and gave us the first evidence of gigantism in freshwater turtles. Hmm. hmm. So... Was this on an island where, because we have, no, there's island dwarfism and right. then gigantism. Gigantism happens on islands too, typically with reptiles. Yeah. Like, right? Like uh, the, uh, the Gila, well, not the Gila, well, the Gila monsters, monster. but the, uh, what are the ones with that? Komodo dragon? Komodo dragon. Yeah, with the ones that they've got the uh, arsenic, mm -hmm. arsenic in their, in their spit. Oh, that's the story I didn't get. They were, they looked at the... That was the Gila monster. I, yeah. I, yeah, I know that story. You the know Gila, the, the Gila diet monster. One? Yeah, so a compound taken from Gila monster spit has been isolated. And um, in the laboratory, it suppressed the appetite of rats. Um, but it's not just the appetite, it suppressed the cravings and it suppressed the activity in 
the areas of the brain that are involved in the reward and motivation pathway. Mm -hmm. So, and it, it got the rats to not crave food, to press a lever for food and not crave chocolate, which I personally think is kind of sad. <laughs> But um, the really interesting thing from this is the uh, the compound is currently in use as a drug to control uh, blood sugar for people with type two diabetes, and it's a there's a there's a synthetic version of it that's used uh, to create the the drug that's currently on the market. And so, if this drug is on the market, it has could have this double whammy effect of additionally having the benefit of maybe helping people uh, if their diabetes is the result of um, of being overweight or having a problem controlling their eating habits, it could also help that uh, be controlled in the end. And maybe it can control a, other types of addiction. So gambling, pornography, I don't know. Are you sure it's just not it's psychological? Like, uh, like you just ate lizard spit. Oh, I'm not hungry now. <laughs> uh, I don't want to eat anything. I don't think that works for a rat. I mean, this study hasn't this study hasn't been done in humans yet, but uh, it's interesting as it is in the rat world. Uh, update on that turtle story. They're saying the turtle did uh, look like it would have a, a massive, powerful jaws that would have enabled it to eat anything, <laughs> basically anything in the area, and they believe it could have even fed on crocodiles. Whoa. Whoa, that's a big turtle. That's a big turtle. Cro crocodile eating turtle? Mm -hmm. It's a giant, that's a giant turtle. Why doesn't he exist anymore then, I wonder? Too big? Yeah. Not ener energetically efficient, I suppose. Well, yeah, 60 million years ago? I don't know. I mean, most turtles have survived through the ages quite well. I don't I know. I mean, why Galapagos they're... tortoises are about the size of a dining room table, I would say, right? So that's still a yeah, pretty big, big enough. I mean, tortoise. they're big enough tortoise. for a man to ride on them, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Also, it seems like the larger the turtle or a tortoise, a lot of the time, the longer it will live. I know it's not yeah. directly a correlation, but it does seem like when they're no, larger, it, they is... live longer. Is it is it the is it that correlation or is it that they are in have indeterminate growth that they oh. they grow larger the longer they live so the older the tr the the older the animal the larger it is interesting so does that mean that these turtles were really really old yeah could possibly could be could be and you know they were in this freshwater lake I can picture if you had too many of these giant turtles uh, that they would just eat all the food. Yeah, and then you're stuck in a lake. <laughs> then you're stuck in a you're stuck in a freshwater lake. You're not out in the ocean. You know you can't keep. Yeah. There's not more food going to come your way, uh, <laughs> and you're not going to be able to swim <laughs> 60, somewhere in the Gulf Stream to go find ago, more. People, yeah, people weren't people weren't necessarily restocking rivers and lakes with <laughs> fish. At that point yeah, this is fresh water, so they were yeah they were stuck in this habitat and may have eaten themselves into oblivion. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. You got any else? anything else on that turtle? Or should we move to Blair's? <laughs> Blair's Animal Corner That's with it. Blair. Hey, everybody. So today I have a story about crows. We know crows are very smart, the Corvid family. Very, very smart. Well, now we think that they're able to distinguish between human voices. Hmm. So in a research lab... In Vienna, they had these crows, and I think it was a pretty small sampling size, but it, was not, it wasn't a lot of crows. But they had crows, and they started to notice that these crows had responses to different people, just their voices. So what they did is they recorded five different researchers who worked in the lab with the crows saying the word, hey. And then they recorded, I know, really creative, right? Hey. Then they created, then they recorded some people that they didn't know saying the word, hey. And they played these sounds without the people present. What happened is actually probably the opposite of what you would expect. They kind of ignore the people that they've heard before, but when they heard the unfamiliar sound, they perked up and looked around. Oh, yeah, because that's the threat. That's the unknown. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. And, I mean, you would probably think, just because we like to anthropomorphize things, Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> that 
<laughs> they they would be excited about the person that they know. Hey, I know that person. But really, just like, oh, it's that person again talking in the lab, whatever. Oh, I don't know that person. Is that person dangerous? And then they extrapolated to think that maybe these crows could differentiate different animal or different birds by their voices as well. And these weren't crows. Mm -hmm. They took other corvid species like magpies that live with crows. And actually sometimes the crows will team up with other birds like magpies to find food or to protect themselves. They'll sound an alarm. And so what they found was that they had the opposite effect with the people that they didn't care so much about the birds they hadn't heard before, but for birds that they did know that were also lived in the lab with them, they perked up and looked around to find them. Hmm. So the reason I found this super interesting was because I hadn't really heard about a story like this before or a, um, any research done like this where you could actually see for sure that an animal is responding to somebody's voice as opposed to their smell or their presence or some sort of facial cue or something. Hmm. They actually are responding solely to the voice. But I would That's extrapolate to say that perhaps this isn't just crows. I know crows are super smart and they're smart. They're smarter than a lot of other animals. But just from my own experience with animals, I would say that there's a lot of animals, if it's advantageous for them to recognize a human voice, mm -hmm. they will. Yeah. And whereas a crow, because in nature, they're pretty heavily entwined with humans in their survival, it's mm -hmm. going to be advantageous to them, even as wild crows, to recognize humans. In fact, mm -hmm. we've seen recently that they can recognize human faces. Yeah. But... For an animal, especially in my situation where there's a captive animal that's dependent on humans for food and interaction, they figure out somebody really quick just by their voice. And yeah. I will be with an animal at the zoo and I will call out their name and they will respond and come running over looking for food or maybe some sort of interaction. But then you know, some people at the zoo will hear what the animal's name is and strangers will call out the name and, and they, they won't, won't pay care any at attention. All. Yeah. So it, in that situation, it's advantageous for them because if they respond to that voice, they get food or they get some affection or interaction. But if you took a wild rhino, for example, they it wouldn't matter to them a human voice, one from the other. But in captivity, it wouldn't matter. Yeah. I think, I think you're right on target there with how you're thinking about this because... It, sound travels further in an environment also. Mm -hmm. So you'll be able to have more warning right. about whether or not there's somebody familiar or unfamiliar mm -hmm. in the neighborhood. And if you are constantly keeping an ear out for what's around you, then, you know, you're going to, you're going to be, you're going to be familiar with certain things and not with others. Right. And if you think about crows in a city, too, because they mm -hmm. are urbanized, there might be one person that walks by every day, walks by the park where the crow lives and throws mm -hmm. them some crumbs. They'll there know, might be another recognize. person who walks by every day and throws a rock at them. <laughs> and it's important to know one from the other, for sure. But if you never hear, uh, I mean, what would be interesting is to know whether or not it's the voices that are really important to the crows. I mean, right. we learn now that they are able to differentiate mm -hmm. voices, but they're probably di differentiating all kinds of sounds right. all the time. And so in a city environment where maybe somebody's walking past and doesn't talk to them, but you hear the click, click, click of their shoes, mm -hmm. maybe the sound of their shoes or some other auditory cue is what's important. Right. So I think that, you know, that would be interesting to see. If there were other, if there are other auditory signals that yeah. crows are picking up on to actually have a richer awareness of their environment, right? And actually, recently there was this really interesting video or uh, Nova episode with crows where they had this whole thing where somebody wore a mask mm -hmm. and did not nice things to crows, <laughs> and then someone else wore the mask and they knew that person was dangerous. But the really interesting thing was that then that crow's offspring, without ever having met that person before, knew that the mask was dangerous. Genetic so they could memory. commute to each other. Yeah, so they could somehow communicate to each other, whether mm -hmm. it was through genetics or something else. They could 
relay that information. And I wonder if they can relay audio information. Um, I'm just trying to do a crow call. <laughs> Masks are bad. <laughs> My my favorite part of that that whole deal was the fact that uh, zoo animals only anthropomorphize certain people. <laughs> like some of us are people, and some of us are just background noise. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's who is important to mm-hmm. your life and your envir- environmental situation, and who is somebody who's new, who could be a potential threat that you don't know right. anything about yet. There's always the, like you said, Justin, figuring out who's a threat and who's not. That's right. always, that's huge in an animal's world. And, and a people's visual- world. It's, and a people, people. it's a big, important thing that people should be engaged in, too. We are animals as well. I would like to reiterate that point. But yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? What? Not, not as much has changed as some people would like us to believe. We're still animals. Yeah, but it's it's interesting to see, to see you know, that scientists there, that people might go, well, this is a well-duh kind of study. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know, as we're talking about, of course, crows are recognizing human voices. Of course they can. But until you do the study, until right. you actually do the science, you don't really know that they can. You just, right. you get you, you kind of guess that they do. And yeah. humans are notoriously bad at guessing stuff. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, and it's interesting with the crows too, because they can simulate human speech. Mm-hmm. So you can even think about crows the are, fact that, are mimics. Yeah, yeah. That they not only can they recognize it, but they can turn it into something in their head that they can reproduce. Yeah, I would. I would bet that other mimics for sure would be able to yeah. recognize different people's voices. I imagine that if you did the same test with starlings mm-hmm. and um, I'm trying to starlings and. Uh, um, mockingbirds and any other kind of mimic Mm -hmm. a parrot maybe that you probably are going to find a similar result Mm. ever used to have a uh those are fascinating i think it was a magpie oh magpies i love magpies it used to do it used to now this was a long time ago when uh when cars had those those horrible vibration alarms and they'd go through that series of different alarms remember those (laughs) Yes. There was a magpie that would do that out in the, uh, like at seven o'clock in the morning behind yep. my house. Every morning, it would go through all the sounds that the car alarm made. <laughs> it was awesome. Thank you, magpie. Thank Recently, you, magpie. Um, actually, I was somewhere with a friend and we thought we heard this red tailed hawk calling. We kept looking around for this red tailed hawk over and over and over. And it was a little bird. I forget what kind, but it was a, um, a bird that's capable of. Yeah. Probably doing like a that mockingbird or yeah something. I think it was a mockingbird but he was he was just up in this tree I know he was just laughing ah! at me look at those humans <laughs> looking for the hawk there's no hawk <laughs> oh I am I am convinced we are entirely entertaining to birds <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure yeah um in other stories not related necessarily to uh the recognition of of sounds, but just hearing sounds in general. Whales have been shown to be able to turn the volume down on their ears, which is really interesting. These results were presented by Dr. Paul Nactagali from the University of Hawaii, and they were presented at the Acoustics 2012 meeting. Uh, the researchers were uh, were working with a false whale named Kina, and they had some I, some idea that the whale was responding to sounds differently and might have some kind of coping mechanism to deal with sounds that changed in uh, in loudness in their their decibel levels, and so the the researchers started playing her a uh, like a, a just a a tone, a pure tone that to, to kind of let her know that other sounds were going to be coming and then played sounds in increasing increments of, of loudness. Uh, so the neutral tone, she learned eventually that the neutral tone was this signal. And at first, 
uh, and they measured from the outside, they measured her brain activity. So the electrical activity of the brain responding to the sound, which I think is a really interesting way to actually measure what was happening. So the phys there was a physiological signal of her brain activating to the different sounds. Initially, before she learned that the neutral tone was a signal, her brain started reacting, reacted very intensely and reacted even more in uh, intensely as the sounds got louder and louder. And then once she, ta once she learned that that tone was a cue that these other sounds were coming, um, the, they didn't record as much activity from her brain. So it's either her brain got turned down in response to the sounds that were coming or the louder sounds, or she's actually in some way able to modulate her hearing. And so this is a, you know, a single individual whale that they're studying, um, not, you know, a massive, a massive study. And all they've done is measured brain activity in response to sounds. And what they could be measuring is just habituation over time. So she just learned that this is what was going to happen. And so instead of the brain reacting uh, in, intensely, it, it reacted less intensely because it became, it knew what was coming. Um, but it could also really be evidence that there is, uh, that there is a, a response to, to loud no noises. The researcher says uh, the whale's own sounds sometimes are very loud and they can be over 230 decibel, decibel pulses and then must listen immediately for very quiet echoes. And so what, what the, the researcher is suggesting mm. is that as they're producing the sound themselves, maybe they turn down their hearing because they're producing this really loud noise. And then when they have to listen for this quiet echoes bouncing off of stuff, they have to turn their hearing back up again. So increase the so it's like increasing the gain, decreasing the gain while uh, while producing sound, increasing the gain while uh, listening for sound, so that they can catch very catch uh, very quiet noises in a sensitive manner. I mean, to me, that almost just sounds like whether they're paying attention or not. But you know, I just I have no idea how a whale's ear is constructed I, I have no like it's not like our because we're you know in water they don't still have like the little little hairs in there do they i think i would i would have assumed so but then i never really thought about that before um yeah so the ears are very similar to uh to our ears in that there is a um the actual ears. I mean, her whole the the whole head of a whale. Some uh, the whales that echolocate they have um, more of a um, an echolocation organ in their head. But whales also have ears um, like like other mammals do. And so uh, you have um, a membrane against which um, sound waves can push. And once the sound waves and really the sound waves can come from all around the the whale um, to get into the air but once the in the ear the inner ear fluid is going to vibrate and those vibrations uh, are going to move little hair cells that will uh, signal the brain that there's a sound at a particular frequency and one of the problems we this is an interesting study because we're worried about loud noises that humans are making our, our radar installations um sonar that we, installations that we're that we're doing underwater underwater testing we make a lot of noise underwater and there is evidence that we are affecting whales behavior maybe causing mass beach beachings and strandings um maybe even uh, ca causing severe damage in uh, the ears of whales and so if some species of whales are less likely to be affected by the noises we make, that's great. But it could all learning how whales listen and how they hear it could be very important to to going ahead in a responsible manner with making noise under the ocean. Hmm. Kind of fun stuff. Hmm. Hmm. There's lots of lots of hmms and hmm, huh, hmm. hmms from Justin today. Well, I know they can hear. I mean, the way the sound travels, the decibels, and the low tones that they use, uh, they can communicate across the ocean with one another, uh, which yeah. is going to require a great sensitivity. But I, I mean, even at the close range, I want. I would think that their ears 
with then being able to be so loud and need to listen to such subtle sounds be much more indestructible than, say, a human ear. Uh, or at least, you know, but then I don't know. Can you get ear damage? I guess you can still get ear damage underwater, right? Absolutely. Humans, right? I've never... Mm -hmm. This is like a whole thing I've never even thought about before. So now I'm going to have to be all like ears That's underwater. Right. Why, how is that different than ears in the air? <laughs> it's a good question for thought. <laughs> so why doesn't everyone out there just think about it for a while? Because it's time for us to take a break. This is This Week in Science. Stay tuned. We'll be back in just a few moments. I'd like to thank Audible.com for sponsoring this hour of This Week in Science. Audible.com has a library of over 100,000 audiobooks and is the leading provider of audiobooks. That's right, audiobooks, books you listen to. You just put in your headphones and you listen and, and you, you bathe in the sound of story, which I think can be a very very pleasing pastime. And Twiss has found all sorts of science-based books in the Audible library, and we know that you'll find something that you like in there that you'll, that you'll enjoy just relaxing to, listening, learning maybe. And if you want, if you haven't tried them before, you can try, start a free trial today. Download any audiobook in their library for free. All you have to do is go to audiblepodcast.com slash Twist. That's right. Audiblepodcast.com slash twist and get your free audio download right now. That's right. Go do that. Additionally, Twist has merchandise that you might enjoy. So head on over to twist.org. Support Twist. Get a little bit of swag to, to make your day happier. And uh, we have a 2010 science music compilation. It's a CD. That's right. Come on. It's a collector's item. Get one for yourself. And we have World Robot Domination t-shirts. Both of these items are lots of fun. You can wear your bright green t-shirt for all your friends to see how you're looking forward to World Robot Domination in the future. At the same time, you can play them your science music CD. Enjoy it. While you're there at the Twist website, you can make a donation too if you don't like the swag. Twist is supported by listeners like you. Your donations pay for our hosting, our bandwidth, contractors we need to hire, fun things we try to do for the show, and we we appreciate any amount that you are able to give. $2 to $200. It really doesn't matter. Anything is a help. Anything helps keep this going. Uh, you make this show possible. So we currently accept donations through PayPal. So go to the current episode page, maybe listen to the show that's up there, watch it if you want to watch it in video. And there are some pink donation buttons down toward the bottom of the page. Click on one of those and donate. We thank you for your support. We really couldn't do it without you. And we're back with more This Week in Science. That's right. Science! Hey, you know something that came to my attention this last week that I think might be interesting to our audience? 
there is a, a, a television show that is uh, going to be produced and take place on the TBS um, network. And this television show, it's going to be The King of the Nerds. Are you a nerd or a geek? Are you between the ages of 18 to 30, male or female? If you're proud and passionate and want to fly your nerd geek flag and uh, and win a competition and maybe win the show and be on TV and all that kind of stuff, uh, they are currently casting and you have until like next Friday to submit a video. Uh, so if you're interested, submit, submit, submit. Um, they are looking for your email, your name, age, city, state that you live in, phone number, recent photos, and a brief bio on what makes you the best, most ingenious nerd, most mm -hmm. intelligent person, science person out there uh, to Casting Ariana, C-A-S-T-I-N-G-A-R-I-A-N-A -A 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 at gmail.com. Yeah, totally sucks means... about the age limit on that show. <laughs> the greatest geeks that I've ever known have always been over 30. That's right? when you That's when you get into full stride. If you're a geek or a nerd, that's when you really hit your peak. I, it's I probably so. even maybe early 40s. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I know. <laughs> you're, you're done. Like, because there's like a whole, there can be like these whole awkward stages of not quite being, you know, committed to your geekdom. And I don't know. Age limit on that kind of bugs. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, Blair, you could do it. I could. I already have an application video. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I'm going to poke you and make you do this. Okay. <laughs> Submit. Will do. All right. Justin, tell us some science stories. I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, folks, do you ever get depressed? Feel down about the day-to-day -day grind of life? Well, there may be a solution now due to this uh, current research. You could try getting knocked up. What? Apparently, <laughs> parents experience greater levels of happiness than the general unchilded public. <laughs> greater levels of happiness and meaning in life uh, <laughs> through their children, which is... Which is, they always tell you, that's the wrong reason to have children. I don't know why that would be a wrong reason. That sounds like a great reason to have kids, right? <laughs> Meaning in life, greater level of happiness. Why, why would that be? How is that terrible? Children will not make you happy if you are unhappy, though. Yeah, actually, this is a quote here from uh, Sanjay Lumba. Uh, oh, gosh, that's a name. <laughs> Liam Bomberski. <laughs> Liam Bomberski. Uh, we're not saying that parenting makes people happy, but that parenthood is associated with happiness and meaning. See, that's something that <laughs> I'm not saying having a kid will make you happy. I'm just saying having a kid is associated with, you know, being happy, right? Very interesting. <laughs> and so they, uh, continually within this uh, one and a half page document that I'm holding in front of me, it keeps referring to some sort of popular myth that people with children are less happy um, I, I've never seen that in, uh, parents. Of course that can, there's always, there's always financial stuff and other things, but I, I mean, people without kids have that too. So who knows? Uh, one of the things they were, they were saying, uh, here, if you were at a large dinner party, the parents in the room would be just as happy or happier than the guests without children. And that, uh, amongst the findings that, uh, that, that parents were more happy spending time with their kids than they were doing any other portion or part of their day. Uh, fathers? What? 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 I'm sorry. I'm just finding this really hard to believe. You don't, you're not happy as a parent? Oh, well. You, uh, don't I'm happy, but don't not really. You know what? You are in the <laughs> toughest time too, because you're you're actually a diaper changer right now. You're not you're not quite a parent yet. You're a diaper changer, a uh, food vegetable. Yeah. It, it improves. <laughs> the, the relationship be, will grow beyond that. Uh, what you're experiencing right now. Yeah, well, I'm just I'm I mean I'm at this point in parenthood where I think back to the dinner parties that I got to go to. I think about how much fun I had. I think about all the things that I did and the amazing stuff that I, I got to think about and work on. And now I'm just working kind of on like one project mostly. 
which yeah, is my you know, son, and he's fabulous, and I love him. Oh, but you know but, what, Kirsten? To to, yeah. to be honest, you did more things than most people do anyway. Also, most what people was aren't the, that what was active. The age of the children that these people had in these studies, because yeah, if everyone had toddlers, to I feel like maybe the happiness scale might have been different. <laughs> <laughs> and if the children are able to, you know, take care of some of their own bodily functions and feed themselves, perhaps it gets. I'm, right. I'm, I'm sure well, there it gets are... better when the kids can help wash dishes. <laughs> Which they never will. Um, this is actually they do go into a little more detail. Uh, first of all, fathers in particular express greater levels of happiness, positive emotion, meaning in life than their childless peers. Uh, older oh, and married pa parents tended to be the happiest. While this wasn't quite true, uh, and that was compared to other people in their, their age bracket who didn't have children, but wasn't necessarily true for single parents or very young parents. So perhaps you're just very young, Kirsten, and that's why you're not experiencing. I'm just very young. You're just very young. That's what it is. Findings suggest that parents are not nearly the miserable creatures we might expect from recent <laughs> studies and popular representations. And I, I think I there's... <laughs> I think there's a deeper thing miserable. here, too, and, and I've, I've, I've talked about this on the show before. Even if you don't have a happy experience being a parent, even if you are miserably suffering through raising a child, every year that you don't have children, if this is a fear of yours that you'll be one of these people, every year that you don't have children is a year less that you will get to spend with your grandchildren. And at some point, uh -huh. that will be the only thing important to you on the planet. It will be the only reason you get up on a Saturday morning is to have the grandchildren over for a couple of hours and they will get you through staying clinging onto the planet <laughs> for another week just to see them grow. So I would say do not hesitate. If you have an opportunity to uh, get knocked up, do so immediately. Yeah, and, and I just have it's to say... It's better than a 401k, I'm telling you. I just you. have to say come back and, and, and survey me for this kind of study when I am a grandparent. Oh, I'm yeah. sure I will be very happy then. And also, Can I also say, I feel like this could all boil down, as all things do, to evolution. <laughs> In that, if the whole point of us being here is to spread our DNA, wouldn't it be evolutionarily beneficial if we were happier if we had children? Oh, I'm sure the brain is just filling us with all this. I think it, would, it makes a lot of sense. Why is some it working small, to strange, me? demanding human comes into your life and starts demanding things from you? That'd be intolerable if it wasn't for some sort of brain junk, some sort of brain <laughs> narcotic that that's uh, <laughs> making you empathize and love your children. Sure, I, I have no doubt that the brain is forcing us to love our children, but I'm saying it works. It's good stuff. <laughs> Everybody should try it. And, you, and you'll probably mess up your kids because they don't come with a manual and everything you think you know and are getting taught, you're going to get it wrong. And chances are, just just out of my, I'm, I'm really trying hard with my own kids not to screw them up. Oh, there's Kai. But just, you know, everybody grew up and saw <laughs> yeah. everybody else's parents screw them up, right? This is this has happened over and over and over again throughout history. But when you get to be a grandparent, then all the pressure's off. It's not your job to fail at, <laughs> fail at raising them anymore. It's now your job just to experience them and have joy with them. So go out, get knocked up, reproduce, <laughs> especially this audience, especially those who are watching disclaimer. this show. These As are the Justin, people I want to reproduce more than any of the other people on the planet. You if you're watching, like my father. If you're watching this show, <laughs> you ne we need more of you. We need more minions. Go this out there and make some more minions. <laughs> I think this even is if all you have to stop listening out. to the show right now <laughs> and take a break. You can watch this again later on the podcast, or you can pause the podcast, come back to it. If you have an opportunity to reproduce right now, go take it, then come back. Right. You can listen I, to us I, anytime. I agree with, I agree with Golda Zader in the, in the chat room. This, this is Justin's attempt to try and prevent idiocracy from coming to oh, pass. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's move into some science news as opposed <laughs> to that? whatever this last <laughs> little conversation was. Right. <laughs> Um, how about Kepler? I love Kepler. Mm. Uh, NASA's Kepler Space Telescope has been um, at work recently, not just looking for 
planets around distant stars, but actually looking at the stars themselves and uh, and what they are doing. So recently, our own sun has had a bit of an active period. If you didn't weren't uh, aware, there was a pretty active flare that uh, that was sent towards the Earth, um, and a big active spot on the sun uh, just passed by us and. I think we've pretty much made it through without without too much damage for this this stint of time. But other stars around the universe, around our galaxy even, um, can be bigger and maybe have even just g- more giant storms on their surface. And what they call them are super flares. And Kepler has been peering at super flares on distant stars. Um Basically, the telescope is staring at 100,000 stars in an area about 600 to 3,000 light years away from our planet. And it's looking for dips in light. Uh, And the dips in light indicate that a planet might be transiting in front of the star. But in those observations, it's also looking for brightening, sudden brightening that might indicate flares or even uh, super flares. Um, So Hiroyuki Maehara from Kyoto University in Japan have reviewed data and looked at the statistics um, and compiled statistics on the frequency and size of super flares in these 100,000 stars. They saw 365 super flares during a 120-day observation period. And so um, very few, only about 0.2% of stars like our own experience these giant super flares. And so that's good news for us because we kind of want to avoid a super flare now that life is flourishing on the planet. Um, But it could potentially be a beneficial event in some systems. Uh, It's suggested that the impact of a super flare uh, might enable life by providing energy in the atmospheres of the distant worlds to be able to initiate or start chemical reactions that get life going. So super flares might be really important, maybe if life hasn't quite gotten the jumpstart that it needs. But once life is going, a super flare is not necessarily going to help things along. Um, Yeah, so Kepler is keeping an eye out, not just on planets, but also on four planets, but but for uh, on the on the sunspots and the flares that are occurring on different stars. I think it's really cool. Really cool. Um, According to this BBC article, the biggest recorded flare on the sun was what they call the Carrington event, and it took place on the 1st of September, 1859. And I just wonder, since they have, uh, since they've had the Solar Dynamic Observatory in orbit around the sun, um, how long it's going to be until we reach something that might be as strong as that Carrington flare. And in comparison, super flares can be. Uh, 10,000 times stronger than the Carrington flare. So it could be it could be bad news for our own planet, but it doesn't seem like our planet is real our, our sun is really a super flare kind of sun. Aw. Yeah. Only point two percent. No disco star for us. Mm, we don't got a mm. disco star. No. Tell me another story, Justin. This is incredible. This is a, a new device which could restore sight to patients with one of the most common causes of blindness. Researchers from the University of Strathclyde, Strathclyde, Stanford University of Cal- and California are creating a prosthetic retina for patients of age-related macular de- degeneration, which affects one in 500 patients between 55 and 64, one in eight aged 85 or more. Uh, this device would allow them to see their grandchildren and thus live happier lives longer. Uh, The device would be simpler in design than existing models. It acts by electrically stimulating neurons in the retina, uh, which are then left relatively unscathed by the device itself. So it's, it does, it, it's not a big thing that they, it's sort of like they make a little pocket in the eye and they put this thing in there and it, uh, it would use video goggles 
to deliver energy and images directly into the eye and be operated remotely via pulsed near-infrared light. Wow. Which is uh, different than the other previous generation of prosthetic retinas, which are powered through coils, require tubes and fuses or something, complex implant surgery. It's a thin silicon device that converts pulsed near-infrared light into electrical current, stimulates the retina, and elicits visual perception. It requires no wires and would be a very simple thing to do. Uh, <laughs> the implant is thin and wireless, and so is so easier to implant since it receives information on the visual scene through infrared beam projected through the eye. The device can take advantage of natural eye movements that then play the critical role in visual processing. This sounds like a tremendous, tremendous step. So have the, this is just a uh, an idea at this point. They're not. They haven't. Have they actually tried implanting it into anyone, or is this just um, just a device that it's an idea basically that they've come up with? They've created the device. Uh, okay. I do not see here any examples of it. The device has been shown to produce encouraging responses in initial lab tests, and is reported uh, in the in an article published in Nature Photonics, but it is now being developed. Further. So it hasn't actually been implemented into anybody's eyeball yet. Okay, because I because there was a similar study that was like a week ago or a couple of weeks ago, um, where they have a different implant that they've been testing that is helping people regain sight for a similar uh, a similar macular degeneration. I think I think for macular degeneration, but this is cool. This is this is the future. It's it's yeah. here where it's catching yeah, but- up. The one that they're um, that they're actually that is actually implanted into people at this point, it does take. It has like an external. It has something that's implanted under the skin, and there's a uh, basically a computer part that goes with it, and there's all this extra stuff. So, yeah, it, it it's surgically implanted into the eye, but weighs like twenty pounds. It's really, <laughs> no. it's really cumbersome. Not that crazy. Oh, you're no. not allowed to get up when you're using it. You can't make any quick head movements or it'll yank your <laughs> eyeball out. Yeah. Uh, some researchers at Tokyo University have developed a, uh, a device to help uh, help researchers understand dolphins. What are those wacky dolphins saying? Are they Was, was Flipper really saying? <laughs> hey, hey, come help. Someone's in trouble. Was Wait, it really a lassie moment? Or Timmy's caught in a well. Just, How would you even please? know? <laughs> was it was it was it a lassie moment? We don't know. It's just was Flipper just asking for fish, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so um, researchers have developed a dolphin speaker, and this device is. Um, allows humans to produce the full range of dolphin sounds, which is pretty important because if we can't produce the full range of dolphin sounds, we can't necessarily uh, get close to approximating their language. So to understand how the sounds are produced, what they mean, they need to be able to play them back and see how dolphins react. And so um, I don't know necessarily in in... In the bird world, when we're talking about bird song, nobody's really figured out what different bird sounds mean versus that songs are for mating and calls are for kind of territorial displays. Um, but usually it's a playback experiment where you have a recording of a call or a song and you uh, play it in an area where there are birds and uh, then you see how the birds behave and then you understand that the call or the sound, how they act and you get some idea of its meaning. Maybe not its exact meaning, but some idea. And so they can do this with dolphins as as well. You can record their sounds and do playback, Um, but they want to try and really understand the production of the sounds, how they travel underwater so that they can attenuate the sound maybe. Um, so the speaker produces sounds from 6 kilohertz to 170 kilohertz. And this uh, this is great because it covers the whole spectrum from uh, low frequency noises to high frequency noises. Um, and it's based on a transducer sandwiched between pieces of acrylic and it has a quadruple piezoelectric panel 
for broadcasting high frequency sounds and a single silver circle for broadcasting low frequency sounds. And uh, after playing it to uh, playing some sounds in the wild and uh, comparing them to recorded sounds that were, were obtained from dolphins, they looked very similar. And so uh, the next step is to actually see how dolphins react to it. So we will see how the dolphin speaker helps us understand dolphins. Are you a researcher who speaks with dolphins? Let me know what you think. You have anything else, Justin? Uh, researchers at Duke University Medical Center transplanted a set of human genes into a zebrafish. And then they used it to identify genes responsible for head size at birth. Why would they bother doing that? Head size in human babies is a feature that is related to autism. Interesting. One in 88 children have this. Head size is also a feature of other major neurological diseases such as schizophrenia. I did not know this. I had no idea the size of a child's head could be related to anything other than the size of the child's head. Uh, in medical research, we need to dissect events in biology so we can understand the precise uh, mechanisms that give rise to neurodevelopmental traits, said senior author Nicholas Katzen-Sanis, PhD, who probably doesn't sound anything like that. We need, right. we need expert scientists to work side by side with clinicians who see such anatomic and other problems in patients if we are to effectively solve many of our medical problems. So this was just a, an experiment, it looks like here, to go over the number of genes that they could splice in and see which ones would cause the fly offspring to have larger craniums. Uh, and then to zero in on why it is that there seems to be that correlation between those genes and these later neurological developments as they've seen in humans. That's interesting. Many human conditions have anatomical features that are also related to genetics. There are major limitations in studying autistic or schizophrenic behavior in zebrafish, as we probably can imagine. Uh, but we can measure head size, jaw size, other facial anomalies. You know, it's something interesting that we I, I, I always thought has just been absolute kook science when they're talking about measuring craniums or nose ridges or any of this stuff or noculal ridges or any of this. But if you think about it, and they're putting up a picture of the cone heads on the screen right now, if you think about it, it kind of does make sense because any external feature that you see is, is the outer shell of what's going on inside the skull. So... Yeah, and and every cell in your body is, has pretty much the same genetic information in it. And so the expression of genes are going to have uh, one gene expressed a certain way in the brain might have a different effect expressed um, in, uh, in the skeletal uh, development. So, you know, the same gene or group of genes might have very, might be linked to lots of physical and behavioral traits. So physical brain, physical body, physical head. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. If anybody is uh, in a place where like most, basically the, the Western United States, the Pacific Ocean... <laughs> <laughs> on May 20th, uh, there is a solar eclipse that will be occurring. Uh, NASA has a wonderful map uh, and that allows you to see the path of the eclipse. It's, it's pretty, pretty cool, pretty cool path. So uh, Eastern Europe, Western United States, you should be able to see this eclipse. It's special oh. because it's an annular eclipse, which means that on this occasion, the moon is, uh, it's further away from the sun, from the earth than usual. And so it's going to be smaller than the sun. And so there will be a red ring from the sun uh, peeking out from around the, the moon, the shadow of the moon. So... Uh, and if you are, yeah, but if you're right on the coast, move. Get, I mean, don't move like you're where you live, but uh, move inland because you're. Mo it's amazing. I've been uh, commuting to the, the sort of the Bay Area, the coastline. It's like foggy here all the time. You can't, you yeah. can't see stars at night hardly ever. 
Yeah. Go up so into the Central be, Valley. You need to be someplace where you can really see this. Um, the eclipse, probably the best time to see it is uh, towards the end of the day. Um, I believe um, Phil Plate, the bad astronomer, was mentioning that uh, in where he is in Colorado, um, it will be... <clears throat> excuse me, it's going to be uh, setting as a ring of fire, which would be pretty cool. Mm. Yeah. If you're if you're on the eastern United States, the sun will have set by the time the eclipse is really getting going. So you're unfortunately not gonna get to see it. But it'll it'll happen again. Don't you worry. It will happen again. It, so. Somebody somebody in the chat room asks whether or not they should go to Bakersfield. No. Under no circumstance. <laughs> Under no circumstance uh, sh should you ever go to Bakersfield. I understand I've, if you have to go along the 99 and drive past it, um, but even then doing so, do so with caution. Right, right. Not recommended. I, I think that about does it for our show today. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. You can Google us in the iTunes directory. Just search for This Week in Science. Or if you have an Android device, we are in the Google Play Marketplace as a Twist for Droid. All one word. Twist the number four droid. That is an app in the Android Marketplace. Or the iPhone Marketplace, whatever that's called. Uh, we are simply Twist, T-W-I-S. For more information on anything that you have heard here today, you can find show notes on our website provided by the lovely Blair. Our website is twist.org. We also want to hear from you, so email us, Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com or Justin at thisweekinscience.com. Yes, but be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere on that subject line or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. Uh, actually, it's much better, though, if you just contact us directly. We are at Dr. Kiki and at Jackson Fly and at Twist Science and at Blair's Menagerie. Ma Blair's Menagerie. Blair's Menagerie. On You'll the get Twitter. it one of these weeks. I, I just know it. Yes. <laughs> menagerie. Yes. That's such a, that's like a, is that a French word? Menagerie. Uh, we love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover, address a suggestion for an interview, an inside stock tip or a haiku that came to you in a dream, please let us know. And we'll be back here next week with more great science news. We hope you'll join us again. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> this Week in Science. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi, aye, 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 aye. Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. science. Got a lot.
laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought. And I'll try to answer any question you've got. So how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said, then please just remember it's all in your head. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 this week in 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 science. 